This is a, a, a webinar session that is part of St. Andrew's Science and Congregations Ministry. And our ministry um, is really trying to think of ways to serve the church and the broader public um, during this time when the science and faith interface seems particularly relevant. And I also want to acknowledge that this is Holy Saturday. And we don't often celebrate that um, in the same way that we do Good Friday and Easter, but it is certainly a time um, when the followers of Jesus experienced an incredible amount of grief and mourning and were tempted to despair. And I think you know some of us now can identify very deeply with those emotions. And that's one of the reasons that we picked um, to invite Kelly Drenner to be with us today to talk to us a bit and have a discussion about coping during COVID-19 social distancing restrictions and um, trying to think about what research shows uh, about how we can be helpful to ourselves and others in terms of mental health and coping um, more broadly. Let me just um, introduce Kelly briefly. Um, she has a PhD in public health. Um, and in addition to a PhD in public health, she's also a, a trained um, therapist. Um, she worked before her current position at University of Houston at UT Health and um, in the VA, specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy and um, motivating people towards health behaviors that are healthy. Um, now, as most of you know, um, Kelly Drenner teaches at University of Houston, um, where she's a professor. She teaches courses like health and behavior theory, epidemiology, of course, particularly relevant right now, and um, culture and health, among other courses. Um, she's um, just been an amazing part of our Science and Congregations team, and I was so pleased when she agreed um, to lead us this afternoon. So the way we're going to proceed right now is Kelly's just going to give um, a short few minutes of remarks just to, to set the framing and the stage for this conversation. I then have a few questions for her, so we'll kind of talk back and forth a little bit. And then um, you can be thinking of questions during that time that you have that we're not answering. And if you could write those in your chat window, um, I will field those and ask them to Kelly. And um, really, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. And I think that uh, it's an especially important time to be thinking about mental health. I think that we are definitely focused on physical health in this crisis with um, COVID-19, but I think that we often underestimate the emotional uh, toll that these kind of crises take on people. Um, I am definitely thinking about, and especially uh, my heart, uh, is um, concerned for uh, the healthcare workers. I, I just think every day about um, what they are going through. I think about what the aftermath is gonna be like for them to see so much suffering, uh, to see so much um, death uh, that they're not used to happen, happening in such a short period of time. Some of those deaths are going to be their coworkers, um, and so I am really concerned about uh, the PTSD that many of them may suffer as a result of this. And I think that that is something that we're going to have to be mindful of as we go forward from this, from for healthcare workers. Um, but. Uh, in the meantime, we have to figure out how are we going to get through this? How are we coping in the midst of this crisis? And I think that this is bringing up a lot of challenges for people. Um, and and um, uh, that is definitely something I'm seeing. You know, one of the, uh, uh, you know, I'm still teaching the semester and uh, one of the announcements I sent out to students was uh, titled, Nobody Plans for a Pandemic. Um, 
and I, I think that's true. I don't think any of us had a plan for this um, in the sense that, um, um, uh, you know, we couldn't have imagined what it would be like on the side of uh, the physical distancing that we're doing. Um, you know, uh, while some of us definitely got toilet paper early past that, um, there was no real plan. I mean, we couldn't have planned for it. Uh, we couldn't have imagined what it would be like, but Brandon Walker uh, reminded me in our multicultural small group uh, that that uh, feeling that we have that maybe we can't name um, is grief. It's grief. It's grief over um, um, the big things we've lost. Um, in this, but it's also grief over the everyday things we've lost, um, uh, the relationships we're missing, um, and fear about what we may lose in the midst of this. You know, I, I think for my students, uh, I have a lot of basketball players in my class, and they lost the whole NCAA tournament, and, and I know in the whole scheme of things, that's not a losing of life or someone you love, but to them, that was a big thing. But, you know, people have lost proms and graduations and um, things like that. Um, but we're losing a lot in this. Um, and um, mostly we've lost our sense of um, everyday stability um, that we've come to count on. Um, and I think that is part of what has put people off balance. Um, so I think that is important. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is really what I uh, focused my career on in that school of thought. And the idea behind it is that it's simply the idea that our thinking affects our behavior. And then there's the converse side of that, that our behavior also affects our thinking. Um, and so it's a reciprocal idea. Um, and so we can, uh, 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 and, and so uh, I think in a time like this, we tend to have a lot of negative thoughts. And uh, when we're thinking negatively about situations, then we start to, our mood starts to shift toward a negative way. And I think when the news around you is so negative, um, it's easy to start to fall into despair. Um, and that, uh, uh, so uh, one of the tools uh, toward improving mental health is to start to become aware of some of the thoughts that you're having. Uh, around some of these and, you know, uh, being able to name your feelings. You know, I think that um, uh, lately I noticed that I've been feeling some grief, some anxiety, um, uh, irritation, um, uh, sadness exhaustion um, and I forget to notice the other more positive things that I'm feeling like contentment, satisfaction, um, uh, gratitude, um, peace, uh, whimsy even um, and uh, all of that starts to lead to um, some joy. And, um, you know, I, 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 that I, I forget that joy can be in the midst of even all of this bad stuff that's going on, but that uh, part of uh, our mental health is to look for those things. Um, Elaine, you're, oh, yeah. Yeah, um, 
Let me, if I may, Kelly, ask you just a couple of, of questions that, um, that you and I have been talking about and I found your answers really helpful and I wanted others to hear. Um, we're in such a unique time and I wonder as someone who has training in mental health, why do these particular social distancing guidelines as a result of, of COVID-19, um, why are they particularly difficult for us in this time? And maybe what does research show us? What kind of research can we draw on to maybe help us and help others? One of the things uh, that research shows us over and over again is that uh, one of the things that helps build resilience in people is social support. Uh, so when we are uh, physically distancing ourselves from other people, uh, we are often, uh, that means we're distancing seeing ourselves from our social support. Um, and that can, that is a huge loss uh, for people. And so uh, finding a way to still have social support um, uh, becomes our big challenge in that. Um, so uh, the literature shows us over and over again, people who have social support do better at any health uh, indicator. So uh, it becomes a huge uh, important factor. So that is one big issue. But another big issue is that um, over, overwhelmingly people report that, that change is a challenge for them. And this is a huge change. Um, it's a change for us to not go into work every day. We lose our sense of structure to our day. Um, so there's that. Um, also, uh, people are having to parent and work at the same time, which is unusual for a lot of people. Uh, it could be also um, that other people find that they're more alone than they were. If they live alone, it could be that they got their support, uh, that uh, they most of their social interaction were through their work or through their daily activities. Uh, and now they don't have um, their social support at all. Um, so those are some, but these huge, big, shifts in the way uh, we interact uh, have created some major social disruptions. So uh, I, I would, uh, so it is physical distancing and social distancing, social in the sense that we've lost our anchors. Mm -hmm. I, of course, we're, we're having this conversation in the midst of a church context right now. And I wonder what churches broadly can be doing during this time um, to help people and to, to really help ourselves. Um, and also what St. Andrews might be doing in particular to be helpful during these social distancing requirements. Well, I think uh, one of the things uh, I've noticed is that a couple of people have reached out to me from uh, different small groups that I'm a part of, uh, have sent me text messages to see if I'm okay, to, to see if I have everything that I need. Um, and I think that uh, reaching out to people to keep up those relationships despite um, our social distancing guidelines. I know that small groups that I'm a part of are making an effort to still meet, uh, even though it's over Zoom, to still have programming. I think that those things become uh, really uh, important um, and also it would still add some structure to people, some normalcy uh, to uh, life. I, I think that that uh, kind of thing uh, is important to continue the best we can. And I think that 
anything that we can do to uh, continue to be a social support. I mean, that is the job of the church, um, I think, is to provide that kind of support to one another. That is the thing we do best uh, mm. for each other. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's really great. I'm I'm thinking of questions to ask you, but I'm also taking notes myself, Kelly, because I want to make sure I get down what you're saying. Um, maybe if you feel comfortable doing so, you could just tell us a little bit about what you've been experiencing personally um, during this time and you know, what's been hard for you um, about the social distancing requirements and, and also what's, what's perhaps been helpful. <clears throat> well, I think... Um... For me, uh, the hardest thing has been uh, that I've had to, for my work, I've had to switch all of my courses uh, from an in-person format to an online format. Um, and that has meant that I've had to learn a whole lot of new technology. So I am uh, technology overloaded at this point. Uh, I've become a Zoom um, expert, I feel like, at this point. Um, and for good or bad, Zoom has become my friend. Uh, so I'm using it for some of my classes. Um, uh, and uh, that has uh, it's become helpful in a lot of ways. Um, it's interesting to me because I am an I uh, view myself as an introvert where I tend to get my energy from uh, recharging alone. And, and yet what I find difficult is that now I'm really alone. Uh, I don't have even, um, you know, when I would go to work, I would at least uh, have the interaction with hundreds of students. And so I'd feel like I would get that or um, uh, go to the grocery store or uh, some of the uh, organizing work I was doing. I would meet with friends and, and do some things with them. And so not being able to do those things means that I have like no social interaction. But one of the things I have done, which is so out of character for me, is to organize Zoom happy hours with my friends, um, to uh, um, make sure we do those kinds of things, uh, uh, join a Zoom book club, uh, uh, things like that, where I can still talk about the things that are important to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Up until I broke my arm, I broke my arm last week, uh, and that wasn't fun, but I was doing a paint by numbers, uh, which was very mindful and did not require any technology, which was a nice break uh, from technology. Um, so it was a grown up paint by number. Um, which felt so wonderful and it was colorful and it just felt bright and cheery. Um, I'm reaching out to friends I haven't talked to in a long time ago. I find myself doing the calling instead of waiting for other people to call me. Um, and that feels good. It's mm, really neat, Kelly. Thank you for that. I really appreciate you being able to to share your experience, your personal experience too, beyond your research, that really means a lot to us because I'm sure some of us can really, you know, identify, yeah, with what you're going through. Yeah, thank you. Um, if folks can um, ask questions now in the chat window, I'll um, I'll try to field those. I'll ask you another one, Kelly, while we're waiting. Sure. Um, you and I were talking the other night and it seems like some people, as you said, who are living alone feel incredibly lonely and other people feel 
frenetically busy um, because they're, you know, if you have um, even one child or multiple children, all of your work and all of your childcare is happening in the same space. Sometimes people don't live in tremendously large spaces. You can't even get away at all from the people that you're just like with the people and you have no diversity of social relationships. I'm just wondering how those two groups of people can be helpful to each other, if you have any guidance about that. Well, I think that, um, I, I think that reminding each other that there are different ways to look at situations is definitely helpful. Um, I, I think that people who are alone tend to have um, maybe some really good strategies for uh, maybe mindfulness or um, how to uh, enjoy uh, some uh, time to themselves, how to recharge from that. Uh, people who are frenetic might uh, could learn from that. I think also uh, people who are alone uh, might uh, can uh, help uh, by uh, getting on calls or Zooms with some of those uh, busy people and helping maybe to entertain or uh, do something to help uh, those uh, busy parents. I know that uh, one of my friends has two kids and uh, she loves when I get on uh, calls with them because it gives her a little bit of a break uh, because I'm definitely entertaining to those kids. And especially <laughs> when my cats get on Zoom because they are definitely entertaining. Mm. So things like that may be helpful. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, in our kind of frenetic household, I know it's our own doing because we got a puppy right as this all started. So that was our, our choice, uh, but it's made it quite lively. Um, and we really look forward to, um, Mandy, as some of you know, Mandy Kung directs our children's choir and has continued to do choir with the kids through Zoom. And that's like one of our favorite times in the week in our household, in part because it gives us a bit of a break um, too. Um, so someone asks in your um, Zoom classrooms, have you noticed any different behaviors among your students, either positive or negative? So as a teacher, what are you noticing? Well, I've noticed uh, that they are really helping each other out. Uh, the chat uh, function in my Zoom classroom is really um, quite active. Um, and they're answering questions for each other, uh, which I find to be especially helpful, where you don't see that as much going on during a regular class because they're focused on me. Um, they're not uh, talking to each other like they are during the chat function. So I find that to be an interesting um, experience uh, that I monitor the chat. Um, I, uh, I do think we talk a lot about COVID-19 uh, in class uh, because I'm, they ask a lot of questions about that in class that I have noticed on Zoom. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I have a question from uh, someone uh, that we'd like to pass on uh, to Kelly, and it's um, it states it's hard to replace the physical interaction and touch that we need daily. And are there um, how how does one manage during this time? Any suggestions or thoughts on that? Yes, uh, you know I had a, a counselor once uh, prescribe to me five hugs a day. Uh, as a therapeutic intervention. Uh, and I, I know that we, uh, if you live alone, you may not be able to get that. But I think uh, even when you live with people, I think we can forget to hug each other, forget to remind each other that we love each other, and to 
just being more mindful about that um, and to be kind to yourself. Mm. Uh, I think that taking time uh, to appreciate your own body, to appreciate your own uh, strengths becomes an important piece of mental health. I think um, some of us can tend to be pretty hard on ourselves. I know I, I have that tendency. Uh, I am especially good at finding uh, my, what I perceive to be my failures and not so good at uh, finding my strengths. And so being, uh, uh, being mindful and uh, strategic to make sure you acknowledge those things daily. Um, it's not the same as a hug, but it is like a bit of a self hug in a way that you can uh, think about the things you've been successful at. Um, and uh, yeah, that's an important piece of mental health, uh, finding where we are, uh, what we're good at. Uh, that's excellent, Kelly. That's really excellent. It's really excellent. And what a, what a wise question as well. Yeah. Um, so um, one of our listeners wants to know, as a healthcare provider, how should I deal with the anger and frustration towards an industry that seems to be betraying its own? Um, nurses and doctors are being punished for speaking out about inadequacies in protective equipment and being forbidden from wearing their own PPEs. I know, again, Kelly, you're, you're really burdened with this as well. So. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I, uh, gosh, I am praying for you guys. I, I empathize. I actually am angry about the situation as well. Um, I, I hope you have somebody you can talk to that you who hears you every day about that. I think that my experience has been anytime I can turn that kind of anger uh, into action, um, that feels better for me. Um, and uh, I think I see a lot of healthcare providers uh, trying to turn that anger into action. And I, I think at this point, that's the best people can do uh, um, without, uh, uh, and I, I just don't know what the answer is to that. I, I think prayer is certainly part of that, and I know that sounds so small in the face of such danger and in the face of such suffering for you and for the patients, and uh, I don't know how to make this better for you. Mm -hmm. And I am so sorry. Uh, all I can do is say that I hear you. I'm with you. I think most of us are with you in this um, and uh, are angry and in the midst of it too. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had a better answer for you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Are there things that um, you think you know, from your experience, Kelly, we can be doing as church, as a church or um, as individuals to be supportive of those we know who are healthcare, healthcare workers? I, I think that uh, we shouldn't let this go. I think we should complain too. I think we should turn our anger into complaints to the legislature. I think we, uh, should remember this for sure uh, when we vote. Uh, I think that there are things that, you know, here, here's what I will say. My students have been tracking this pandemic since the beginning of the semester. So the idea that while, while we personally couldn't plan for how this was gonna play out, public health people were planning. We knew this was coming. We did foresee it. My students foresaw it. 
Um, and so we saw this coming in, in January, we were already tracking it. Um, and so um, I wish our leaders uh, at, at uh, local state uh, and federal levels had taken it more seriously sooner. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for that question. Um, it's something we all um, need to be thinking about. Um, this is another um, um, difficult question, Kelly, um, for parents who are sharing custody with another parent. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard others say this as well, um, that you know, these kinds of situations can become incredibly complicated during COVID-19 restrictions, maybe the, the other parent is not following things the same way as, as the first parent would like or something like that. Um, are, is there anything you, you could say to that um, that we could be thinking about here? You know, here, here is where I'm reminded over and over again, we can't change another person's behavior. Um, that the best we can do is uh, mind our behavior and do the best we can at being the best parent we can, be the best human being we can. Um, we can do our best to keep our child safe, but, um, you know, I wish uh, that co-parenting were easier, um, but there, it, it is just, difficult and um, just being the best human being I can be in this situation, um, monitoring my own behavior, thinking of what is uh, uh, best for my child, remembering that my, my behavior toward the other parent affects my child um, is also an important um, piece of this equation as well. Um, you know, the, the, the one good news I try to keep in mind as a, a person who also thinks statistically is that children don't seem to have the um, bad outcomes that uh, adults have. Of course, they can be carriers of it, um, but that, that hopefully would give you some peace as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean, it is a tough situation. I wish the law made it easier, but they don't, it, it's mm -hmm. not and just being, you know, I always try to remember, I can't uh, change someone else's behavior, but I can, I am responsible for my reaction to that behavior. And along those lines, I, I wonder um, if you have advice for how we can talk to children about what's going on. Um, the social restrictions that have been placed on children, you know, placed on us rather, are also placed on our children and um, they're experiencing it depending on, on their age and situation in really different kinds of ways. Yeah, and I think children feel like this is gonna be forever, you know, uh, to, in their little lives, this is forever. Um, and I think just trying to, um, uh, how do you let them know it's serious, but n not that everybody's going to die, you know? Uh, I think just to um, uh, remind them that you're in charge, you've got this under control, that you're positive try to keep a positive framework and that the things you're doing are going to make the situation better and remind them also I think that this is a great time to remind them that their uh, uh, actions affect others and that this is their opportunity to help other people that they're helping their neighbors and things like that and maybe enlist them in helping other people uh, by talking to people maybe who aren't, um, don't have uh, people uh, who are alone, uh, maybe dropping off food at a neighbor who is uh, a shut-in or older or 
getting uh, maybe if you get groceries for someone else, maybe they can help you deliver those uh, and then knock on the door and then walk away. So those little things to get them involved in the helping side of this rather than just the passive side of it. I've been thinking about the, it's sort of, we're going to the technologically complex and skipping over the technologically simple, but I've been thinking about the old fashioned phone tree that we used to have in yeah. churches when I was growing up and, um, you know, could we just be calling each other more? Um, yeah. 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 What a concept. <laughs> Kids can get involved in that too. That's it. Yeah. Um, are you finding, uh, I wonder, just Kelly, just from your own faith, where you're finding redemption in this, um, you know, where you're learning things or um, just maybe you could share a couple of those things. I have heard so many stories. You know, it's interesting um, that I think in some ways this physical distancing is bringing us closer together in other social ways. I'm hearing of uh, people reaching out to people they haven't talked to in a while. I find myself uh, calling and staying in touch with uh, friends who are, are maybe older than me who may need some things. You know, every time I am making a run to the grocery store, I'm reaching out to somebody and seeing if I can pick something up for them. And I'm hearing stories like this over and over again of people who are uh, helping other people. Um, I know that uh, uh, when I, early on, I uh, wasn't feeling well and uh, a friend bought me groceries and dropped them off at my door. Uh, that was super sweet. Uh, I know that in this time of not being able to find toilet paper, the big mission is toilet paper. And if you find some, you share some. Uh, people are dropping toilet paper off to other people. Uh, things like that, that you are seeing. I know that um, in my classes, I am having an opportunity to do so much more mental health work with my students who are reaching out um, uh, I, uh, via email and then I'll set up Zoom meetings with them, students who are struggling or have family members who are struggling or things like that. So in that way, I'm finding um, more opportunities to connect in a deeper way than I would normally during a semester. So I, I hope that was the an, an answer to your yeah. question. No, it's just, it's wonderful to hear. I think it's encouraging for us to hear just um, little pieces of redemption in the midst of the grief and the trials and, and just the hardship, the hardship mm -hmm. we're all experiencing. Yeah. I'm not seeing any more um, questions in the chat window, which is okay. We'll hold it just for just for a couple more minutes. I know people's tolerance for long, long Zoom conversations is not the same as it would be for a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, yeah. Any any final words? Anything you want to say to us, Kelly? I did want to uh, say that there are some really I uh, know uh, 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 that. People are looking for strategies. I know uh, that uh, for coping, one is to add some structure to your day. I know everything seems to be a little unstructured now, uh, but adding structure to your day um, is an important piece as best you can. Not so much structure that uh, if the plan blows up that uh, it, it feels like all is lost, but a little bit of structure to your day. Uh, apparently, there's a lot of COVID cooking going on. And so um, uh, that, that has been kind of fun. I find myself cooking a little more and maybe 
um, uh, that is something that uh, you may be interested in. Um, people are also getting in touch with that, cooking more meals at home. Um, I think that there are some apps uh, on the phone that are, are particularly helpful that can help with mindfulness. Um, there's one called Calm that you see advertised on TV right now that's really good. But there's another one I know of that a lot of our athletes use and I've used uh, to help deal with anxiety. It's called Headspace. Uh, and you can set it up to give you reminders throughout the day to take some minutes, uh, some short breaks for mindfulness. Uh, I'm reminded that uh, exercise doesn't have to be done outside of our homes, that we can bring it into our home. Um, that there are lots of uh, resources online. Uh, exercise is a great way to improve our mood um, and uh, that can be helpful. But also uh, if you are at home with your family and your kids, that getting outside uh, with the people you're quarantined with is perfectly okay to go for walks and rediscover nature or bike rides or things like that can be incredibly helpful and mood lifting. Um, the other thing I uh, would suggest is there are some resources for telehealth um, that uh, I uh, have here. Hold on, let me. Uh, UCLA, uh, uh, uclahealth.org has some mindful meditations. Uh, they have some great uh, breathing meditations, some um, uh, body scan meditations, some things like progressive muscle relaxation. And those are in English and they have some in Spanish as well, which is a nice resource. Um, there are also telehealth, uh, mental health check-in websites. Uh, uh, tau, T T A O connect.org is therapy assistance online, um, maybe a helpful resource as well. Of course, uh, you guys are, uh, we have Stevens ministers at the church, which may be a good resource for people if you're struggling. Um, and of course, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, if you need some help, but I can be your friend. I can't be your therapist because I don't do uh, therapy uh, uh, in a licensed way anymore. Uh, I, but I'm happy to be your church member friend uh, if there's some way that I can help you out. But, you know, just a reminder, social support is um, one of the biggest ways we build resilience. Um, and uh, Jeff is right when he has us build a gratitude list in church, um, that that gratitude list, maybe doing that every day is a way to remind yourself of all the things you do have to be grateful for, even if, if there's only one thing on your list. That's right. Kelly, thank you so much. Um, really, really helpful. I feel like I learned a lot um, from hearing you and just listening to you and being with this group. Let me, let me end this time, if I may, by just praying for this group. Um, we're going to have much of this um, online, um, of course, without you know, any names attributed or anything to questions. But um, so if you know someone else who could benefit from hearing this conversation, um, that would be fantastic if you could point them to this. It'll be on the Science in Congregations webpage of the St. Andrews website. So let me pray for us. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for Kelly and the way that you have gifted her. We are grateful for her. Um, we love her and we pray a blessing on her um, during this time that you would give her wisdom as she so desires to help others that you would um, help her to learn that you would comfort her 
um, in times of loneliness and need. And we pray for the group of listeners here that you would comfort each one of us, that we would know um, that we are all grieving some kind of loss right now and that you would help us to um, enter into communion with you in our grief. We do lift this up to you. We pray for our healthcare workers. We pray for those who are nurses and doctors and public health officials, those who are on the front lines, trying to exercise healing, their calling of healing in the midst of the most difficult times when they're not even physically protected themselves. We pray for that right now. We pray for those who are trying to parent um, children um, who are um, shared dual custody. God, we pray for those parents and we pray for those children. And we pray for all of us that no matter how small our pain during this time, we know that it matters and that you are there with us. And we affirm that right now. And God, we pray that you would help us to experience this Holy Saturday fully and that tomorrow that you would help us to experience the redemption that is Easter. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for thank being with so us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. We really appreciate you. Thank, thank you. you for coming and for listening. And please share this recording with others.